Hi, welcome back to Getting High on Anthropology. Today we have a guest, Ashley Pacillo, and she's the author of uh, Breaking the Grass Ceiling. Um, welcome, Ashley. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no, it's a pleasure to, to meet you and to learn about your work. So as I indicated to you, I learned about your book um, as a professor teaching this course at UC Denver um, called Cannabis Culture. Your book, I used excerpts of, of it with students, and it was a hit because of the content and the different narratives. So for no one, for people who've never heard of the book, um, mm -hmm. describe it uh, to us and then the, the story of how it got started. Yeah, for sure. So um, it came together really, really quickly. I, I had been to South by Southwest a year prior and I was lucky enough to have our panel submitted last fall, which was called Breaking the Grass Ceiling. And shortly after the panel was accepted, they said, hey, if you have a book, we'll put it in the bookstore and the wheels started turning from there. So um, I, I had a great relationship with some of these women. Some were complete strangers to me and I was calling them literally out of the blue, like, hey, how are you? Can I write this piece about you? And we have two weeks to get it done. Um, the whole book came together in a very short amount of time. It was about 45 days because we had to hit this deadline to get it um, into the show. So. I, I really like the way that it came together. Um, it's a biographical collection featuring 21 different women who have been in the industry since very early days, you know, 2008, 2009. Um, women from a number of different states and different professions within the cannabis space. And um, yeah, we, we kind of looked at their stories and, and tried to understand what caused them to get into this, especially when they did, when the industry was much more stigmatized than it is today. Um, so yeah, very, very quick project, <laughs> a lot of work, a lot of no sleeping, and um, yeah, really, really happy with kind of how it came together. What I love about the origin story is you had this opportunity, like, oh, if you have a book, you can, you can display it. Um, have you had, have you ever written a book? No. Or, okay, so you just, <laughs> you had the confidence that you could pull it together, I and mean, what was that like? Like, what was your workflow like to, yeah. to get it completed? It's a really good question. So, no, I had never written um, a book before, but I do a lot of technical writing and creative writing for my profession, so writing is definitely a strength of mine. Um, there was a lot that went into just learning how to put a book together. Definitely a learning process, and I've, I've heard from a few people over the last few months that are looking for guidance from our, our learn the hard way kind of experience. So um, basically, it was, it was mid-December, and you know I, I just decided, let's make a go at it. And uh, I called my friend Lauren. I've known Lauren since I was seven. She's an incredible writer, a very creative mind. And I was like, do you think this is even possible? She said, yeah, of course it's possible. You know, every time you say you could do it, you figure it out. So we, were, we decided to take a stab at it. And I think the most challenging part at first was getting buy-in from some of these women because, like I said, some of them were, were friends and colleagues of mine. Others I did not know prior to getting them on the phone. And here I am telling them that we want to write this book about them. And, you know, I, I think that they really needed to trust me and that that trust had to be built very quickly um, for them to sort of buy into this project and believe that it was not some kind of expose. It was truly an opportunity to tell their stories. And um, yeah, so most of them are, were pretty excited with how it came out, I think, and um, have been asked when the second is, is coming. Do you have a date for that? <laughs> no, I do not. <laughs> it was a lot of work. Um, you know, we used a, a self-publishing website to kind of put it together hired editors to make sure that we were on point. Um, each woman actually had the opportunity to read their pages before they went to print to make sure that they were you know, factually correct and that they were represented well um, and accurately. And um, I think that made the process more comfortable for them, that they knew they'd have this opportunity to kind of see how it was coming together, how this was going to be shaped. About the question guide or the list of questions that you use, Tell me about the process of coming up with those questions and what were the ones that you found worked really well and was mm. there one or two duds that didn't work so well? I can't, I can't think of any duds off the top of my head. Um, I think the questions that were really interesting to write about and, and the ones that women, the women we interviewed seemed to really um, anchor their, their stories around are you know, their motivation for getting into this, which was very varied. Um, we had women getting into this because they wanted to care for their children. Um, we had women get into this for social justice reasons. We had women get into this because of their own health and, you know, their their passion for 
for using this kind of medicine over traditional prescription drugs. So that was really interesting and, and you know, the way each woman handled that question and sort of answered that question, approached it, was very unique to each person. Um, the other question that stands out for me were the, the ones pertaining to how these women went about telling their families, uh, especially those who are mothers and raising children and, you know, what is that like? What is the school ground or playground conversation like now with the other parents and their teachers? And um, th there was pretty varied response to that question as well, but I think one trend was, you know, that, that especially the women who started in 2008, 2009, this was pretty new. This mm -hmm. was, you know, very, um, I think people probably raised their eyebrows a little bit when they heard what they were doing. And, you know, there's women and, and all kinds of people getting into the industry today, and that's great. And that was part of the purpose of the book, to try and encourage participation, specifically among women. But um, I think what makes the women in this book so so special is because of when they came into this. And it, this wasn't the industry that it is now. Um, like I said, it's it was far more stigmatized then, and people questioned their intentions as moms, as business owners, um, you know, I, one woman was, was reminded of feeling like she needed to know she wouldn't go to federal prison before she could really do too much more than she was doing. So those were very real concerns then. Right. And not that, that, you know, they aren't to some degree today, but, but the time frame where they got involved is very, makes them very, very special, very um, courageous in a lot of ways. And I think that's why they're considered to be pioneers. Now that you're an author of this book about weed, so take <laughs> us to like a Thanksgiving dinner or whatever. Has there been any funny incident in your own family, how they respond to you? Like, what do they say and how do you deal with that? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, Cause I, I've always, I've always been someone that had a plan and kind of knew where I was going and what careers I was going after. So I think this definitely came out of left field for my family. Um, yeah, I wasn't a huge cannabis consumer ever, uh, especially prior to moving to Colorado. I, I, I really didn't know very much about the plant. Um, I grew up in Massachusetts. My parents are very, very liberal in a lot of ways, but drugs were, were drugs. They were bad, and that's how I was raised. And it took a long time for me to sort of understand the, the complexities of this issue and all of the many, many benefits that this plant has to offer to people. So. In some ways, I think because very few people in my personal life expected me to go down this road, they were really interested. And you know, I, I feel like I have a good head on my shoulders most of the time in, in, with regard to the decisions I make. And um, I think you know, everyone might have been a little skeptical, but we're really intrigued and curious. And um, certainly, some very interesting conversations around around the family dinner table, and you know, connecting with friends that I've known for a long time. So, yeah, it it might have been a little bit of a surprise to some some folks. <laughs> was there any one conversation that you thought was kind of funny, or people, any individual still in your family not taking this seriously because it is weak? Because there's always going to be people who, for yeah. some reason or another, think it's just crazy. I, but I was just curious if you had any conversation that you remembered. Yeah. Well, the, the first person that comes to mind is my grandmother. You know, she's 99. Um, I, I think she thinks that I'm a drug dealer. <laughs> but she's 99, so I think she's entitled to think of whatever she wants. But, um, you know, it's, it's really funny how many people have written to me because of this book over the last few months and saying things like, you know, I've been trying to help my mother, my spouse or my friend understand this career that I've chosen or this medicine that I've chosen. And, you know, something about it being a book, especially about women, um, I think it's, it's helping to make the conversation more normal, mainstream, approachable. And, you know, it's a book. Books are are, are a safe place in a way. You know, you're, we're not asking you to go watch a movie for two hours or go to a conference or spend lots of money. It's, you know, it's a way to kind of dive in and the responses we've gotten from people who have used this as some kind of talking piece, um, it, that's been really inspiring and really interesting that people are using this as sort of a tool. And you know, I, I associate books with learning and education. So if, it, if that's what it's accomplishing, then I'm really, really pleased with that. Could you pull out one of the stories, one of the women in your book, and tell us about the interview process? Was it like them filling out a form? Were you interviewing them and mm -hmm. recording them? Like tell, break, break down that process and then how did you figure out which 
nuggets to use to put together a coherent story? Yeah, that's a really good question. And there's sort of two, we kind of had two approaches to this. Uh, the first was obviously interviewing each woman and, and sort of gathering their stories. And then we had to look at the book sort of broadly and we wanted to make sure that we were telling different kinds of stories, that we were featuring women who had participated in different you know, kinds of careers. Um, I, I was sitting down with Wanda James, who's in the book today actually, and, and she was sort of recapping the day that she got this email from me. And you know, we knew each other somewhat well. She was gonna be doing this panel in Texas. So I think she was like, okay, there's probably something here, but she was laughing about it today. She's like, here you are out of nowhere. And you know, you're sending me interview questions and I, I barely know who you are, or what you're gonna do with this. Um, so we, we wanted, like I said earlier, we wanted to make sure that each woman felt very comfortable during the process because again they didn't know me and really know if I was equipped to do this in a in a good way so we gave all of the women um, the questions up front and certainly encouraged you know each woman to steer down different avenues or different story paths as they felt you know they wanted to share or not share um, we did not ask them to send written responses we wanted it to be a little bit more conversational mm -hmm. um, Nearly every interview was conducted by phone. This was over the holidays in December. Um, and like I said, we had 15 days to knock out the 21 interviews. So there were a number of, of other women that we reached out to um, who we just just couldn't get them in because they couldn't you know, get the interview done in time. And it was very, very <laughs> aggressive. But um, yeah, so they, they kind of knew where we were going with this and what the purpose of the book was, I think. Uh, being accepted to South by gave the book project a lot more credibility and, and they could kind of see why where the tie-in was um, But yeah, it was send the questions hop on a call kind of work through that most interviews were about 90 minutes and then Lauren um, Was really great at, at sort of helping me transcribe all of those interviews and then from there we were able to kind of You know look at look at each story try to figure out the key emphasis points for each woman and um, what makes her story unique and then from there we assembled it like a puzzle and tried to strike a balance between you know these these different goals that they shared yeah no great accomplishment and again <laughs> the, the the book is called breaking the grass ceiling uh, women weed and business yes so what was the criteria of selection or how did you figure out which women to include in the book yeah that is a that's a big question um, and and to start that answer I you know there are a number of women that we would have loved to include. Um, you know, there's 21 women in the book. There were probably a dozen more that we had connected with and, and tried to involve. But again, that timeline, especially over Christmas and New Year's, some people were like, I don't know how this is going to happen. Um, and once they did their interviews, there was a pretty aggressive editing schedule. So if they weren't getting us their, you know, their comments and whatever, we kind of there was a date we just had to send it out. So that was part of it. Um, can you? <laughs> kind of work with us in this very fixed amount of time. Um, and then the second thing we looked at, which we maybe was a little bit controversial of a decision, but you know, how do you, how do you define a pioneer? Does, is pioneering, does that mean that you've been in something for a long time? Does it mean you had to be first? And I think we, Lauren and I really struggled with that question because there's so many women and, and others who have done tremendous things for this industry. So we kind of landed at, you know, the woman, each woman really had to have either been there from the beginning um, and really pushed the needle and really moved, moved the needle, so to speak, in their own profession and path, or they had to have developed a business that was really helping advance women through some other capacity. So Carson Humiston is a great example, certainly not a pioneer in the sense that she was not here in 2008 or 2009. but. She's created more jobs for women and minorities than, than anyone I, I know. And mm -hmm. I think that that's a really, that's a pioneering thing in and of itself. So we've gotten some pushback as to how we defined what that meant. Um, but I'm really comfortable with, with the women that, who participated. And, and, you know, I think we really, we really tried to find a balance between sort of being here in the beginning or, or doing these pioneering things now. You know, the book has really brought together a lot of these women. I, most, many of them in the book have reached out at different points, sort of saying that this was a this was necessary for them to kind of reconnect with one another and share their stories. A lot of these stories are not warm and fuzzy and positive. Um, some of the women, too many of the women we interviewed, feel that you know they 
they were valued in their businesses up until a certain point, and once the business grew, they weren't, you know, that their partners or their investors no longer saw them as equipped to continue growing their companies. And there were some alarming trends that we kind of uncovered as we were putting these stories together. And I think, you know, sharing sharing a story about how you lost your business or how you're no longer part of your business, that isn't easy. But I think, you know, as a collective, sharing that is very, um, it's very powerful. And it, in a way, I, I think it has the potential to protect women who are getting into this now. So, you know, going back to what you said about this being a sort of a blueprint or a roadmap, I think there's a lot of lessons buried in this book, you know, across all of these pages that you, you could at least go into business feeling like you, you're aware of the, the potential outcomes and aware of the, the obstacles that many of these women faced. And I'm, I'm just, I'm really proud of them for sharing what are difficult stories because I think that makes a huge difference for people starting out now. Yeah. No, I, I appreciate what you just said, especially thinking through of like, if there was a chapter on you, like what would be for you the key components of that? And what would be the take home message that you would want if people read a chapter about you? Yeah. Wow. That's a tough one. Um, you know, when I, when I started the book, I, the company that I own, Point Seven, where we, we do um, pre-license and post-license consulting in the cannabis space. So most of our clients are not even in Colorado. They're all over the country, Ohio, Florida, Arkansas, the East Coast, California. Um, so when I started this book project, it was just me. Lauren was brought on next, and now we're up to a team of six or seven when you count our subcontractors. And we're all women, so it's entirely women-owned and women-run. Um, that wasn't necessarily what I set out to do, but it's working really well, and um, I think we've assembled a really powerful team. So, I guess in that sense, uh, you know, I, I can definitely share a story about uh, venturing into something that was completely foreign. At the time when I first got into cannabis, I was 25 or 26. I Definitely had job offers and opportunities outside of the space, but I really felt like that roadmap was going to be articulated and defined in part by the businesses that I was going into and the industries. And I would only get so far based on my age and was going to grow at sort of a predetermined rate. And I hated that. I didn't mm -hmm. want anything to do with that. So, you know, this was this was certainly not easy. I mean, I was like living in my car when I first moved to Colorado and it was summer, so that was okay. <laughs> and I, I had no idea how I was going to tackle this, but, um, you know, I'm proud of that story. And I think sharing it and sh and all of these women sharing those stories is, um, is potentially very helpful. I mean, even to students of yours who are looking at graduation and trying to figure out, you know, where they are going to go and what opportunities exist, I think, Having a plan is good. Like I said earlier, that was that's been me my whole life. But knowing that it's okay to kind of abandon your plan and go down a totally different road because it feels right and it feels like, you know, the right move. Um, having that confidence is, you know, important. And I I feel like I was in college just yesterday, and I wish someone had told me to be a little bit more open-minded and a little bit more flexible about what was to come. So a larger critique that exists in terms of the industry, the marijuana, the cannabis industry, is that it is primarily men. Mm -hmm. And your book is a nice sort of counterpoint to say there are women, let's focus on them, get their stories, heartfelt stories out there. But are you hopeful that this sort of, I've had one student call it like a bro culture, lumber sexual culture, trust fund guys, <laughs> you know, frat boys. So are you hopeful that over time there will be a change and we'll see more parity and if so what gives you that hope mm -hmm. because we know it is a masculinity excessive you know um, maleness is very difficult to crack and yeah. so I'm just curious from your perspective because some people say it's a nice contribution but there may be no change because yeah. it's such a, a, a deep-seated part of our culture especially in the cannabis industry that's, yeah that's um that's a really really interesting question and I think you know, when, we, when we're talking about women's involvement, I mean, I don't know the number offhand, but there are more female executives in cannabis, or we believe there are more cannabis executives in, in, than there are in traditional industries. Um, but one, one thing that came out of a lot of these interviews is that even though there may be a lot of women coming into cannabis and running businesses and, you know, taking executive level roles, 
uh, a lot of the investment dollars are still controlled by the crowd you just described, and a lot of law firms are, are comprised of the same kind of culture. So when you think about an industry and a business, they don't, they don't happen in a vacuum. So we have to not just pay attention to women rising up in cannabis. We need to look at you know, empowering women in these other complementary and necessary fields because they work hand in hand. And I think what a lot of these women found is even though they, they got in early, um, they were very courageous, they were coming into this when it, it was not um, a, as cool or as you know, entrepreneurial as we look at it today, when it got, when their businesses got to a certain point where they really needed, you know, advanced legal counsel and they needed investment dollars, they found themselves at a table surrounded by white men once again. So, you know, we have, we, you can't look at the industry, like I said, in a vacuum, and you have to consider the other ways that we need to be empowering women um, in in these other industries. So, I, I think a great point to make, especially, you know, to graduating students. Um, it, you, not, you don't necessarily have to take this leap into the cannabis industry. There's a lot of ancillary opportunity that can support this business. And it's not, it's going to continue to be more mainstream and we're going to see more and more mainstream companies latching onto this. So I, I think there's an enormous amount of potential, but our, you know, there's, there's risk in not pushing women up through those other you know, business verticals because they, they're so necessary to this. And um, yeah, I think it, educating women about the the risks that exist. A, another big one that came out of these interviews was about um, the importance of having your own legal counsel. So you may have a lawyer for your business. You still need, you know, Ashley still needs her own attorney to make sure that you're protected because your business, everyone has an agenda at that table and you need to make sure that you're covered. And Unfortunately, I think some of these women were taken advantage of on paper without even realizing it. And by the time they understood what they had signed and what this was really going to look like, it was it was too late. And you know that that is not because these women weren't capable of making these business decisions. I think when they were trusting, things were moving very fast, and they still are today. It's hard to slow down and really pause and make sure you're you know you're engaging in something that's going to work out for you. So um, that was a big one, like really empowering women to ask questions, protect themselves, you know, and, and don't make any assumptions about the people you're working with. You need to really, you know, do your due diligence, look into them and um, not expect the worst, but, you know, definitely go into things and, and make sure you're paying attention. Is there something you would do differently next time? Mm -hmm. I mean, I would have started earlier next time <laughs> and maybe given ourselves a little bit more time, but that was just the way it all happened. It was make a decision and do it or not do it, and I'm really glad that we did. I, you know, I'm, I'm someone, I'm an operational person. I, I generally enjoy being in the background of things, so that's been sort of a not, a, not necessarily a learning experience, but getting, you know, being the, the face of something is, is definitely new. Um, and, and that's been kind of fun to kind of figure out and play with. Um, yeah, I, I've, I've learned so much from the experience, especially because I've, the, the book, without realizing it, has opened up doors for me to the women that we interviewed and many other ones. Um, you know, if I could do it again, I think there's a lot of people we'd like to include um, that, you know, that like I said, for logistical reasons, didn't quite make it in. But um, I am hopeful we'll do something in the future with, with some of those ladies. And you know, we're talking about trying to bring this to life on, on camera, bring it to life um, in some sort of an audio play. But I, I think there's a lot that we can do with it. And I hope that you know, we can build off of this and continue featuring and talking about women, especially those that maybe aren't in the limelight all of the time. Um, there's women all over this industry that no one knows that are doing unbelievable things every day. And you know, I'd like to use this book as a tool or other mediums um, to bring them to life and bring attention to women who, who really deserve it. Excellent. So in addition to being an author, you also run your own business. I do. So yes. tell me about that and um, about your business. What keeps you up at night? Oh my gosh, so many things. Mostly the work keeps me up at night because that's that startup life where you where you don't get as much sleep as as you want. It's strange. I mean, I'm working harder than I ever have in my entire life. But you know that that expression does kind of stand when you're doing what you love. Is it really work? 
Um, there's definitely days where I feel that it is work and there's days where it's just sheer fun. Um, you know, being able to work with an outstanding group of women every day is, you know, it's so impactful and, you know, it really, it really gets me up in the morning. I'm really excited to go and, and work with this team. Um, we love our clients. We have some incredible clients that are all over the country, which, you know, I, I love being in Colorado, but this has been really cool to go and kind of see how we can take what we learned, you know, for better or worse in this Colorado market to new states like Pennsylvania and Florida and Arkansas. Um, and speaking of Arkansas, it's like, States I never thought I would do anything in, right? And and you know our clients in Arkansas are, are incredible, and the the way the state is looking at this and considering this is is really um, it's really special. I mean, you'd never expect it, but Arkansas is approving conditions that that took a while to be approved in Colorado. So Great I think news. very um, very patient focus, very patient oriented, and you know it's been it's been so interesting and fascinating to look at how these rules and regulations come together. Um, our firm, you know, we, like I said, we work with two, basically two different types of clients, uh, those that are pre-licensed and pursuing an application to operate a business in one of these other states and markets. Um, and then we also work with groups that have been licensed for a while and are looking to refine their operations, uh, rebrand, go through, you know, uh, different efficiencies or training sessions and that kind of thing. So we really have a broad base of work that we do. Um, which certainly keeps it interesting. I mean, I know lots of people say it, but we really don't have two days that look anything alike and um, wouldn't really have it any other way. Now, do you have one or two pieces of advice for a young woman who wants to achieve things that you've achieved to get into your line of work, whether it's writing a book or having your own business? Yeah. Um, one, thing, one thing I did that, that certainly paid off, and, and there were days where I did not know if anything was going to pay off, especially in the early days of having this little company of mine. Um, but I, I, I'm a huge proponent of, of networking, which I know sounds cheesy and sort of a, a blanket piece of advice. But I think, you know, people will go to an event, they'll maybe email someone, and then that's kind of it. And, and my advice is to not stop. Um, there are people I've stayed in touch with for three years that signed contracts with us over the last two months. And that speaks to you know, staying engaged with people, really like being interested in what they're doing. And, you know, it's not, you can't go into any relationship expecting a payoff right away, nor should you. Um, some of the people I've met, met through these events and through these experiences, I, I may or may not ever work with, but they're incredible people that have come into my life. Um, others I, I've known for years and never expected there to be a synergy. And all of a sudden, you know, we're, we're doing some really cool projects together. So I think the networking piece is really important, but I, I often feel that we're not really helping, especially young people, especially you know students in college, we're not really helping them understand what networking looks like. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just pinging people on email every so often. It's really being interested and checking in and you know being a sponge and open to whatever because if you'd asked me a year ago what I would be doing right now, it wouldn't be this. I and that happened because I was open-minded to the opportunities that people were throwing at us. And That's great. Well, let's make sure viewers know how to get a hold of you. Yeah. So what would be, do you have a website you want to plug? And sure. do you have um, other contact information you could share? Yeah. So my email is ashley at point7group.com. Our website is point7group.com. And um, the book is online. You can find it on Amazon. You can ping me and maybe I'll mail you one. You know, that's one thing I'll never stop doing. I'll never stop taking the coffee meetings. I'll never stop responding to people who have questions because of how helpful people were to me when I was starting out. So I am truly an open book. <laughs>